Welcome to COVID and Climate Change Correlations, a weekly video podcast where I, Daniel Sanderson, engage in a stimulating conversation with post-Keynesian economist Steve Keen. All right. I had to listen to Neil Ferguson. Did you have a chance to listen, Scott? Oh, I, I listened to the first 10 minutes of it. Yeah, I did a double speed for about 20 or 30 minutes, so got a fair bit of it in there. Yeah, so you um, would have descended into the the Austin University, and uh, that's that's what really really what I wanted to chat with you guys about. Okay, um, yeah. Scott's from Austin. Not that this really matters, but you know, <laughs> I mean, he's uh, he's 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 close for a summer job, and this is effectively what they're trying to do is get uh, something up and off the ground by uh, the summer of 2022. Now, Scott and I have been working on a Plank Sip Academy, which yep. goes back to the classics, and we're going to be looking at um, you know a similar to a St. John's sort of model. Right. So um, this uh, would be from uh, Mortimer's great book list and this type of thing. Right. OK. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm seeing with what they're doing is so, so exciting. I think now let me let me kind of um, try and guess maybe what the thought pattern was as you were listening, Scott, for the first 10 minutes and and Steve for a little bit longer. Hmm. I was listening to it again, thinking, well, what would Steve be thinking? What would Scott, would Scott be thinking here? And um, there's, there's a major current in, of, of thought in, in what they're talking about, about ca a cancel culture mm -hmm. and the ousting of people for, uh, you know, free speech and, and this type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm not guessing that's a problem for you. And... I'm not sure what Scott thinks about it, but I I don't think it's really a problem directly for Steve Keen, and I don't know how much this is really your. Um, well, I mean, I, I left the university sector very happily uh, after I was a, I behaved outrageously to a group of clerical staff, um, which I, I've never actually managed to apologise for. I thought they'd basically want to see the end of me, and that's it. But I walked, and uh, my resignation occurred. Uh, one week after I walked into my old building and found that what was my head of depart head of school office, which was a galley, about it was about one and a half meters wide and about four meters in in, in depth, I think, uh, with a view of another brick wall uh, and a window that if I wanted to open, I had to stand up on the on the desk next to the window and then push the lever open. This is in England, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it had been turned into a cafe and into a galley kitchen for the bureaucrats, and I just lost it. Okay, and I was quite insulting um, to the poor staff who they're all female. It wasn't a single man to be seen. About twenty women working on the floor of what was now the vice chancellor's off building. And um, this, to me, is the real problem. It, it, the, the council culture stuff that um, uh, that was being spoken about by Ferguson and Co. Uh, is a byproduct, I think, of the bureaucratization of universities that's a side effect of trying to turn them into commercial institutions. And when you have commercial institutions, what they're insistent upon is you don't offend anybody. Uh, so they have public relations departments whose sole function is to avoid having relations with the public. And this, just, this I think, is more of a source of the cancel culture stuff that um, Ferguson was talking about there than any push from the left um, to, to stop right-wing views being expressed. But it's, it's just the completely wrong model of a university, which, which has taken over in the last 40 years. And I blame neoliberalism for that, not, uh, not lefties. Uh, but it, it's led to a whole melange of disasters that, you know, I can quite agree with Ferguson, uh, make the modern university an embarrassment. Scott, what are you what are you thinking? I think that the whole thing is a is a trick. It's a scam. They're trying to make make it look like they have a plan and that there's a university. But what they're really trying to do is they're trying to keep this idea going among poor white people in America that they should be concerned about dark skin, transgender, gay, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, vote Republican. 
So I think it, <laughs> it's like a, it's like a shill. You know, if, if you go to a carnival, there's someone that's actually working for the for the game. He knows mm-hmm. how to he knows how to work the basket. So it looks yeah. like something's actually happening. So people pay their money. So I, I and they try to get two shills in there. They try to get Stephen Pinker and someone else. And these people realize that it was actually a Potemkin village. That there wasn't a university there. It was just a it was just a it was a non entity in order to promote the idea that we should be wow. There's an alternative to universities that are strictly you know pro round earth and 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 silence the flat earthers and then uh-huh. you know strictly pro holocaust and silent the holocaust deniers so we need shouldn't we have a balance i mean shouldn't we be pro executing blacks i mean shouldn't we be pro i mean in, in, when i was young when i was at oxford you know we were encouraged to speak our minds and be radical thinkers and question authority so they're using this kind of talk to trick people and thinking there's actually a project there but it seems to mm. me that it's just part of this racism anti-woke thing tying it to republicanism to, tr- to trick white people to vote republican that's that's definitely a danger and i, I, I can see that in uh, you know what's going to come out of these things um to me the 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 problem is that that discussion it, it could be made consistent with i'm not saying it this couldn't happen but it wasn't rooted in the in the philosophy of science history and philosophy of science as we know it today and the, the fundamental issue, and I've seen this, of course, in my own, own discipline, is that linear progress is not how science occurs. You have linear progress within a paradigm, but to break up to when when the paradigm starts to fail, then you need a, 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 a nonlinear process of, that challenges the paradigm to move forward. And that uh, is what sciences in general have behaved. Um, They've lived, they've lived up to that, that. That sort of process describes how sciences have progressed over time. Um, but what you can get is lock into a dominant paradigm. And, and that's what I've seen with economics at universities. And if I want to challenge that paradigm, then I get rejected. I'm the one who gets cancelled uh, within the, you know, not within the, within the major universities, when the prominent universities. Um, so I, w- I would like to have a university which was not run by bureaucrats, um, where you designed it in such a way that there was a capacity when, when something, when there was a breakdown occurring or you know a, a dominant paradigm was failing in some discipline, then there was a chance for the for an alternative to be expressed in that discipline. Um, so that's what appeals to me about the ideas they're talking about. Uh, but I. You know, I agree with Scott that a lot of it is just going to be saying, oh, you know, we need somewhere we can push the flat earth theory. Um, oh, they're, so, they're not going to want anything having to do with rational planning of economics. They're, I mean, their, their, their point is to indoctrinate people to find the dumbest of the young Republicans and frat boys on campus and get mm. them to transfer over there. But they're already indoctrinated to begin with. They're like, fuck the poor, you know. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There, there, was, there was a lot. There was some, I mean, I looked at a lot, a lot more of that um, um talk that's two and a half hour uh yeah. video it's rather long to watch but i watched about <laughs> th- i watched about 40 minutes at a double speed okay okay to get an idea of what was being said and like there was so we we're talking about for the, the money section for example right. ferguson okay. was ferguson was being quite correct in saying that money evolved out of credit relationships and you can find those back on the sumerian tablets i've seen the same not the same tablets necessarily but one of my research colleagues is Cornelia Wunsch who's one of the world's experts in translating those cuneiforms. And that's what Michael Hudson's work is about. So he's quite accurate, quite correct about the nature of money. You weren't going to get necessarily, you know, money multiplier myths being spouted by Ferguson if this university was established and his ideas were part of it. Uh, equally, he had, you know, he saw some advantages to Bitcoin, but he was critical of saying Bitcoin can't, as it stands, can't be money. Um and, and various failings like that. So there's a lot of wisdom th- through through the whole presentation, uh, and that wisdom can be hard to get into a, a modern university where, by like taking economics again, they'll give you the barter myth. You know, the money money evolved out of barter. Well, that's bullshit, um, and and that's something which uh, Ferguson also described effectively as bullshit. Um, so there's some wisdom to the people behind it. It isn't all redneck stuff and and suppress. A left-wing thought, um, but uh, you know, I, I can I, I sympathise with the need to bring about a different form of university because what's happened out of the neoliberal takeover of a university is a system that's designed not to offend, and 
uh, a lot of the left got caught up in this as well with identity politics. And, and, and that's what's come through here. You've got a left which should be concerned about, you know, social class issues that's talking mainly about identity politics. Um, and you have a, um, a, a, a sort of corporate public relations approach to critical thought, which is just as debilitating um, as, as, as any right-wing attitude to, you know, critical thought or left for that matter. So I... Um, I think something has to be done about the university system. Uh, whether whether that will come out of what uh, Ferguson and Co are providing, proposing in Austin, I don't know. Um, I've got a feeling, as Scott's saying, it attracts all the right wing learnies. So you know, it's partly a way forward. I, I, honestly, I I don't <laughs> I don't okay. I, I could understand how you how you'd be cautious about that. Um, but it interested me to even. Yeah, I think it's I think it's an interesting concept. It was. It was not only that Daniel wears the hat. I was like, "Hey, maybe it's something I could take as a one of their master's programs." You have Neil, who's mm. saying this is meant to be a challenging process. This is mm. like intellectually challenging, right? Well, the, and, and, and universities need to be places where intellectuals are in charge. And what's happened with neoliberalism? The bureaucrats are in charge, exactly, and right. and therefore you're forced to conform to bureaucratic uh, processes. And one of the things, the last thing a bureaucrat wants is a complaint. Yeah. So yeah. what's actually come out of that is this excessive focus on, oh, we're getting complaints about this particular academic, let's do something about him, uh, rather than saying we're getting complaints, oh, that's good. <laughs> so um, it, the, running universities either along a totally government line uh, or a totally private sector line is wrong because they're fundamentally a third sort of institution. They are places where you do want people both pushing what is currently known and challenging what is currently believed. And um, and you, you know, certainly what, what it, whether Ferguson's idea um, would lead to something which transcends that. We need we desperately need something that does transcend it. Yeah. And uh, I, you know I've been, I was at university in that what I regard as a halcyon days of the early seventies now. And that the range of thought you were exposed to was magnificent. Um, and the range of discussions you could have as a result of that was magnificent. Uh, and then when we got fee paying, the idea the university students should pay fees for the university and then student loans, et cetera, et cetera, they got turned into bloody degree factories or, or certification systems. And, and the interest in, in a wide range of ideas disappeared. And I hate that. And... So for that reason, I'm sympathetic to what Ferguson is talking about. Yeah. Well, I have to say, I mean, I say give them a shot. I mean, you oh, you yeah, got Heather yeah. Hang, who's on the like Heather Hang is is an outspoken progressive liberal, okay, mm. evolutionary mm. biologist. This isn't mm. a, a shyster woman. She's yeah. well respected. She's part of the Dork Horse podcast that she does with uh Brett Weinstein. Yeah. And you know, like I, I just, I don't, you know, like what does, what idea does somebody has to co have to come up with before someone says, "Hey, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's give it a shot." Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, like okay. I, I would like my, my my preference would be to have uh, you, the fees being paid by the state, so that the state provides the money, right. uh, and not not having a profit motive for the university itself, which has been so destructive of, right. of uh, critical thought at universities. Um, and then as, as, as wide, you know, uh, look, the develop, trying to develop university departments that enabled the sort of process that Blank spoke about, uh, where you have scientific revolutions occurring mm -hmm. and, and, and not having a dogma dominating. Um, so I'm sympathetic to all of that. Um, I mean, the, the potential is, of course, this is going to be an extremely expensive fee-based university. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, well, let me take that, that, that is a problem. Yeah, let me let me take the conversation a little differently because it was just an introduction to put it on mm. your guys's radar. Mm. Now, more specific to Steve, there's um, about about growth and getting and building the Steve Keen brand, essentially, right? This mm -hmm. is the idea. Okay. Now, what happens with some of these intellectuals, these superstar intellectuals like Heather Hang, like Steven Pinker? Mm. Um, you know, like Neil, he's on he's on his very well connected, very, very yeah. well connected yeah. with. Yeah. And I would love to see you tap into that stream as well. 
And I think it's, it's almost, I was hoping that the show could be a little bit of, about effective strategy to say who we approach and what capacity. Does Steve want to say that he would express interest in an economics course if such and such and such reach out to Neil? There's Barry Weiss, outspoken, like she she was, she's very liberal, right? Yeah. And I'd, be happy, I'd be happy to have that, uh, that tried. Um, yeah. just that yeah. I, I mean, my my main point is uh, that we, we need a university um, environment that encourages scientific revolutions. Mm-hmm. And and that means something where you, and you know, like I, I tend to think mainly in terms of both the economics and the physical sciences um, rather than, you know, uh, humanities in general. But we do need something that, uh, that enables intellectuals to be running the university, not bureaucrats and not capitalists. Uh, and, and that's difficult. It, it, um, it, when I look back in the 60s and 70s universities, uh, the norm there was the department heads were selected by the department staff, okay, and, and that there was a, a power system that meant that the intellectuals in the university, the academics, had most of the power. Now, that's completely gone. It's all in the hands of bureaucrats and, and managers, and the focus on the bureaucrats and managers is to get as many bums on seats as possible. Uh, and anything which implies bums might leave seats uh, is what they protest about. And that's where the cancel culture comes from, not from the left or right student body itself, but the bureaucrats and the pro, you know, would-be capitalists running these universities who are trying to desperately maximise revenue and most of the money that gets in there goes to their bloody asses rather than to the uh, academics who are doing the actual work. Universities end up being a miserable place to work now. and I that's. Very insightful, Steve. Yeah, and that's, very, that's an awful situation, you know. Yeah, very insightful as a first principle. I, I, I you know, I think that's uh, mm. that's a that's a great observation. I remember mm. that historically, the the phrase uh, "politically correct" was meant as an insult and a put down, and it was invented yeah. by the left to criticize mm. their own people for straying off into these secondary issues and not foc- focusing on on economics. Mm. So yes, it, it's it's a, politically correct is is a tongue in cheek it's an insult but yeah. it was invented by the left to clear clear away these pseudo leftists out of the ranks and now it's by people on the right so you have a university like this which is, of, of course will be limiting the discussion and gearing it towards what steve mm-hmm. just said mm-hmm. you have shareholders are trying to maximize profit and yeah. if, if something's bad for pr they're going to they're going to kick that person out no matter how trivial mm-hmm. the, 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 uh, there is so but what they're going to do is talk about how the left is the left is the source of cancel culture and and so that's the brilliance, I think, of, of the move is, is to be like a maximally radically canceling organization, but have all these props to display as instances of, of, of cancel culture and then make that your topic. So it's, mm. it, it's like four dimensional chess. I think it's very, very wise. Yeah. I mean, we, we had to give a crazy situation from my own past. I was the uh, uh, vice president of the staff union, academic union at the University of Western Sydney. And I was the staff rep on the governing body of the university. And uh, the, the, we had a, a, a strike um, we organised around a particular academic at another university, Wollongong University, to support him. Uh, now, he actually uh, was so anti the union that he ran over the toes of the president, state president of the union to go through a picket line at his own university. Then his own university tried to cancel him, sack him, um, over some of his statements on other issues, I've forgotten what they were, but he was one of the world's leading evolutionary biologists. And what his research was showing was that evolution wasn't entirely random. It wasn't the um, uh, Richard Dawkins blind watchmaker effect. There were interactions on the um, on DNA that meant that if you exposed a uh, bacteria to evolutionary pressure, so for example, you put lactose uh, into the Petri dish, um, then, uh, and, and you then said what actually happened with the evolution of capacity to process lactose in this bacteria. Uh, the rate of evolution was faster in the Petri dishes where the lactose was placed than in, in the Petri dishes where there was no lactose. Now, this is semi Lamarckian, and you can actually find this also expressed in Darwin's um, uh, evolution of the species. Um, 
natural by natural selection. He also spoke about some sort of Lamarckian process. Now, what this scientist did was to establish there was a, a greater rate of evolution in the bacteria exposed to lactose than the ones not exposed to it. So what's, I think it's a section of the DNA called the introns. These are sections of, of the amino acids, the, the, the 20 amino acids that go to make up DNA, that, uh, that do not code for any protein. And the interpretation of his work uh, that I've seen is basically seeing DNA as a quantum mechanical computer. And the sections which don't code for anything are where the changes occur. Um, now, this guy was about to be sacked. We saved his job. Okay. Uh, the union, who, who, he literally rode, rode over the, the, the toes of the union president to break a picket line. The union standing up for his rights to put his research forward is why he continued having a job. And it, it, it's desperate that you get to that stage where it's the union that is defending intellectual freedom. Uh, so I, I, we need something which promotes that and let it, let a guy make these claims. Yeah, okay, they look like they're Lamarckian, but his research is solid, um, and and that's that that is the sort of thing which a university run by the academics will give you. A university run by the bureaucrats and the would be you know, proto capitalists who think they're running it uh, eliminates, and that's real. That's not left or right, that's the danger. It's bureaucratization and the false location of a profit motive in a center of learning. But they'll have the audacity to pretend to be running on principle. Yeah, I know, I know, yeah. You know, the only principle I saw out of those places was shut the academics up. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, <clears throat> anyways, uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I'm an ambitious guy and I've always thought of, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, Steve, you've got uh, some entrepreneurial background to you yourself. Yep. Mm. So I'm just one of those guys that's trying to hobble something together and no, it's not the establishment and no, it's not to, you know, steal the wealth from society. It's just Poor old Dan trying to put and hobble something Look, together. I'm, hap I'm happy to yeah. have it tried. I mean, I, I, there's, yeah. there's, there's potential that the university might work well. Um, and it'd be, it, I mean, the, the thing which I've seen with economics is that there's no chance for an e intellectual revolution in economics within existing universities when it desperately needs one. Yeah. So there's something, and, and that's that was simply, I mean, if I go back to the, um, the 60s and, and look at the academic debate back then, um, it's something which there, were, there was more critical thought in economics being published in mainstream journals then by far than there is now. Now, whether that's been because of this bureaucratization of universities assisting uh, people who you know, maintain the core beliefs in economics dominating, or it's just been a historical thing, I, I really can't say. Um, but seeing the, the desperate state that economics is in and, and seeing no prospect of it being changed in existing universities, then I'm willing to try something else. Well, and here's the thing that I was thinking is that your econ economics, right? The mm -hmm. um, your research and your your post Keynesian approach, uh, the research you've done, the, your models with Vinsky, this whole thing stands on its own. It it, it mm. doesn't really even have to mingle with, uh, y you know, any of that ether. Really, that's uh, true. Yeah, you know, it just it, it doesn't have to. But as an academic to another academic. Um, it's like, I'm Steve, here's what I've been working on. Here's mm. why I think, you know, and, you know, I think we can put a package together to at least get that mm. thing going and then hopefully start stripping or, or putting you into the stream of Gary w or, uh, Barry Weiss, right? Let's get her, get you on her podcast. Yep. yep. Happy. Let's, yeah. you know, let's get you onto Sam Harris. Let's get you onto, um, uh, the dark horse pot. Like there's a huge. Um, exposure here that I think you're primed for a breakout. And <laughs> the only thing, no, I mean, you're already broken out, but even a further mm. breakout, right? Mm. I mean, um, I haven't done any specific research on where Keen appears on YouTube videos, but generally you've been um, kind of like painted into a corner of, of the, um, of the economic shows and, mm. you know, conver and so it's, it's hard. For, I think it's not, it's it's not the tantalizing kind of come look and see 
um, topic that puts you into into some of these mainstream, but you're totally there is what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, you know, it, 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 it puzzles me that, like it's happening with your, this program as well, Dan, I and mean, then the, the, the tiny number of views we're getting, yeah. uh, like I, I'm happy, I, and this is, I, I think most of my videos top out at about 10,000 views. And I then go take a look at, like I look at a lot of stuff on, on YouTube. I'm as much as a surfer as anybody else on that front. And I'll find stuff with 7 million views on, on, yeah. on a related field. How the fuck do we get that high? How do we get that level of breakthrough? And it's simply, so what I'm doing is not working anyway. Well, no, it, it, it is, but it's always mm. time to like rejig. Scott and I try and do this all the time. Yeah. I mean, mm. we try and have conversations about what to do. We've tried different things. We're, you know, we've got umpteen numbers of series on the on our site. Mm. And we're slowly building and climbing the ladder, just like you are, right? And yeah. um, even people, the multi-million view YouTube creators, there's something about the algorithms. Hey, it's free. Mm. I mean, it's like, okay. But I think somebody like Lex Friedman, who sits on this board, is an excellent person. Wouldn't it be great to be on his podcast? He's a yep. still an MIT researcher. Yeah. Um, he's had uh, Wolfram on his show three times. Like, Stephen is, Wolfram. Yeah, yeah, three times. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, no, it's all a conspiracy. They're all out to try and get your money. There's, It's like, come on, man. Who, who are mm. we listening to then? Like, yeah. who are we really listening to? Mm. And and I think that there's a way to get into that slipstream. It's huge. It's where people are inquisitive. They're like me. I'm just like, hey, I want to read your book. I want to find out why you're important. What is all the mm. buzz? Really? There's something wrong with economics? <laughs> yeah, you know exactly. Like, I mean, I, but when, but mostly one person I'd love to have a chat with is Stephen Colbert, uh, because I mean he's one of one of my uh, you know I take take a break from working or watch uh, the Colbert show. That guy's a, a genuine intellectual thinker. Um, <laughs> yeah. he, he's religion position. Uh, he's a, a, a devout Catholic. I'm a devout agnostic, having been raised as a Catholic. Uh, well, what I appreciate is, is true intellectualism there, and that applies across the comedy spectrum in America. Generally, what I can see. Well, I'd love to get in and say, listen, guys, this is just how bad economics is. You have no effing idea. Um, so it, 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 in, in getting into that audience is one of my ambitions. Hasn't happened yet, may never happen, but that's that's where I find the um, uh, the opposite of cancel culture. The engagement culture. Okay, so I imagine um, I imagine you wear the you wear the leather jacket. I've seen you before in it, and you're good. You'll drop an f bomb or two, and you're just <laughs> you've got honestly, Steve, you got the personality for it. But hey, yeah. I, I'll, I'll throw the compliment out to Scott too. He's a uh, he he's he can rant with the best of them. He you know if he wants to get mm -hmm. heard, I'm sure he can. Both you guys are super talented for sure. So that's that's the compliment of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's, the, the difficulty is that you just see, like in economics, I've got to stick with economics, that's, that's of course my main my main thing. Um, most, most people aren't interested in it. And that's the realism. It's only a tiny minority of people are actually interested in how does the economic system function. Uh, most of the people uh, would rather watch a cat video than watch something on economics. And frankly, I can't blame them. Cats yeah. are more entertaining. Um, so it's it's a real dilemma that if if it was if you could comfortably forget about economics because it was in the right hands, then that'd be cool. But it's not, and then that's one reason where where I think we're on the brink of a an end of civilization experience now because mm -hmm. we've let that particular discipline run riot, and um, and it, it's the cancel culture of anything that's been applied to critical ideas about economics. Um, and, and that's why I find it so ironic to see people talking about cancer culture and, you know, the left is driving out the right. Um, in you know, economics, it's the exact opposite, and that's which by, what by far sets the ideology for our society, and it's why our society, I think, is doomed. Mm, yeah, very good. I was going to say very good point. Somehow that doesn't feel appropriate to, you know, praise something that seems to be so perverse. If yeah. people make fun of the base superstructure distinction, I think it's a valid distinction because if you have a base formation, then it has the fuel, which is money, mm -hmm. to provide for the positioning of people and the paying of lobbyists and policy. So mm -hmm. money is a, a different a power than other things because it's fungible and it can become anything. Yeah, well, the, 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 what I see is the problem there is that you've got an ideology which is contradictory to the actual super, uh, super, superstructure, uh, the, the base, or rather the base, 
uh, is completely different to what the superstructure ideology says it is. Uh, I, I would be much happier if we had a Schumpeterian um, uh, superstructure record on the actual base of capitalism, because that would at least be moderately realistic about how capitalism actually functions. And then you'd have a, a, an ideology defending capitalism, which is closer to describing what capitalism actually is. But what you've had by the accident of history is uh, an ideology was completely wrong about its description of the base. And, uh, and then people then try to modify the base to make it, make it fit this superstructure idea of how it functions, this idea of an equilibrium with perfect knowledge and all the garbage that neoclassicals go on with, and a complete dissociation from the physical world. Uh, you know, it, it, is, it, it is an ideology which will, the superstructure will destroy the base. And that's what we're on the brink of. Um, our beliefs about what capitalism is, which are false, have led us to a situation where capitalism may, will, I think, be destroyed by climate change. And what we'll get out of it is an authoritarian command economy, uh, if anything survives at all. Um, yeah, and so I, I've got, you know, the, the base superstructure and say the base drives the superstructure. In this case, the superstructure is destroying the base. Yeah, I could see that. Scott, do you see that too? Yes, more and more people live inside um, ideology, and it's mm. it's almost been completely untethered from the reality. So you have it's like you have an ideology and a reality inside the ideology. So there yeah. seems to be a reference to something that's real. So it's this is called the postmodern condition or or post structuralism. Uh, yeah. Once upon a time, there used to be some resemblance between the two things, but now we're in hermetically sealed uh, virtual reality bubbles that may have no resemblance. But we still have a distinction in there between false and real. Mm, I mean, yeah. even I mean, no, by vaxxers to understand yeah. the, the distinction between like a hallucinatory, hallucinatory cat and a real cat, but it, they themselves are, are hallucinatory. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's partly thinking also about how a university, like in other ideas, how could you reform, have a reformed university system? One thing that's necessary is to break people out of their silos. And like I've, because I live at the, the junction of economics, engineering, and ecology um, in my own work, then I, I do dabble in each of those other fields and and I see just how different each field is compared to what other people think that field is like. So um, like economists, like if if we've had a paper rejected from the Royal Society, the proceedings of the Royal Society uh, at the moment by neoclassical economists as referees. Um, and what they've said is, oh, your criticisms of what we're doing on climate change are so old hat. We've moved on so far from that stuff you're criticising. So three 2021 papers have just come out. Uh, one says that losing, I think I mentioned each of these to you, uh, this is a paper we've now got a, a critical letter before proceeding to the National Academy of Sciences, where these as economists say that uh, tipping six major elements of the Earth's climate at a temperature six degrees above pre-industrial levels will cause a 1.4% fall in the GDP of 20, 2100 uh, compared to what it would be if in 2100 uh, at, at six degrees warming, none of those tipping points went. Now, if you had this paper, this, this paper has been workshopped at economics departments all around the world uh, for the last two years and has come out and been published in an economics journal. If you try to present that to a climate science seminar or an engineering seminar, they would laugh you out of the bloody room. It's so absurdly stupid. So you need some way in which you break the silos within a university. Um, you, you, you can't have every economist having to study engineering to PhD level, for example, but you have to have some way that these different silos interact with each other are forced to occasionally. So you get a reality check on that discipline. And economics, of course, being the one that desperately needs it. Um, so there's there's all sorts of things I'd think about if I was trying to design a better university to, to break out of the siloization that inevitably happens because you specialize in what you're good at. Well, and here's the point. Well, I have to applaud you. That was the perfect reference clip to send Neil. I'm going through it going, that's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so no, the other the other thing is is that if we truly want to test this theory about a contaminated system, um, I, I like uh, a, a contaminated um, idea, right? Mm. Maybe Scott's putting that sort of uh, you know critical theory idea idea forward. I'm I'm gonna say well. Wouldn't it be the experiment to actually have an inside guy? So Steve's going to be a part of it. He'll say, I'll be the first to let you know if it's all messed up, right? You know, <laughs> you can see for yourself how they're going to set it up. Yeah. Um, anyways, I was excited about it. And I mm. thought, uh, yeah, it's 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 worth to, to jump into that stream. Well, we, need, we need something different. I mean, like I actually blame Australia. Um, Australia has been a source of a lot of really bad ideas. Uh, one of them was, uh, was the idea of HECS, which stands for Higher Education Contribution Scheme. So that idea that students should take out a loan to pay for their education emanated from Australia. And now what you've got is you know, global student debt in the trillions of US dollars, um, students graduating with so much debt they can't afford to get taken more debt to buy a house, um, the, the desperate scramble to get a qualification because that's the only way you're going to pay off your debt, et cetera, et cetera. That stupid idea came out of Australia. So did neoliberalism, the idea that you should uh, the, the left the left should show that it's capable of being a better economic manager than the right, and then marry that with progressive social policies. That's what's led to cancel culture. So Australia's had a huge responsibility to setting off those stupid ideas, and um, I would like to see you know some some part of the world break for those ideas, um, and and. Yeah, and something other than the university structure we've got now is is desperately needed. Um, it's it's not going to come out of the the paradigm won't be broken by the people who run the current paradigm. Yeah. So do you think do you think that the um, like how is your um, your your political um, uh, situation, I guess, in, in Australia and the party? Are, they, are there any updates about a potential oh, election? Or? No, the, the election, looking more like it's going to be May, okay. which serves me perfect because, I mean, I'm not going to really be getting heavily into the campaigning side of what I need to do until January because I've got to go back to Australia, re-register to, to be a voter, and then I can start doing all the, uh, you know, foot soldier stuff that's necessary. But, for example, if you want, if we're running in a state with, I think roughly 5 million registered voters. And they, that's broken into about 40, I think, electorates. And each electorate has about 20 or so electoral booths. Now, that's roughly 1,000 electoral booths. You need to have people handing out how to vote cards. And that means 5 million how to vote cards to be distributed at 1,000 electoral booths which if you want to do it properly, you want to have two people uh, at any particular booth throughout a day, which lasts 12 hours. It's sort of like there's voting stations open at 8 a.m. and close at 8 p.m., I think. So that's of the order of 4,000 people. That so I need to handle Scott and I to 5 million there. leaflets, okay? So this, this sort of thing, uh, you realise why you need money to run an election. So I've got to start a GoFundMe campaign to try to raise some of the funds for that. Um, so, so the odds are huge and stacked against you because the mainstream parties, the Labor Party and the Liberal, otherwise known as, say, the Democrats and Republicans, uh, they get funding from the big end of town. They run, you know, they get million-dollar donations from coal companies and so on. And what you end up having is a, they're, they're bought and they then become the lobby groups for the fossil fuel industries, both of them, both the major parties. So breaking that hegemony is going to be incredibly hard. Well, good for you. Good for you. And it sounded like mm. you're inviting us to come to Australia and, and, and stand at the ticketing locations, I think. I've got to get an army of, like, to, to get as much of the vote as I can in New South Wales so that I have yeah. a chance of getting, say, 7% of the vote and then winning a bit more and, and redistribution of preferences. Yeah, I need an army of 4,000 people well, on the day. Hey, we're getting that on the Vox video. I think we're fo close to four thousand, so we're going to employ Vox to say, "Okay, Vox, send your <laughs> send your right wing guys all over to Australia to back speed." <laughs> well, I think that what I'm do is actually leave for what I've got in terms of international exposure and, and get that done because the whole idea of me being—I mean, I, I, of course, I support the party itself, and the party asked me 
to stand as a Senate candidate when Victor, who's the guy who established the party, decided to go for a, a House of Representatives seat instead. But yeah, I want it, 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 you know, I'll be you know I'm going to be the party's person if I get elected. But it's also going to be a chance to put non-orthodox ideas front and centre and get them in a bloody hand side yeah. so that they uh, in a way that I can't otherwise do it. So it's 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 worth a punch, and that's what I'm doing it for. I, I I tip my hat and salute you, sir. That's a you know very um, very ethical approach uh, to what you're doing. It's uh, you know I think it's 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 it should come together nicely. So we're 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 bound for another break, aren't we? <laughs> and by we, I mean you, really. I mean it's yeah. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's something. It's something. I've got to give it a try. Too bad about the more. development of the Royal Society there. It just. Uh, we, we, we can push that further. I mean, the, the Royal Society editors were shocked by the outcome of the refereeing process themselves. So there's a possible right to them to say, well, look, obviously you can see this is the issue we're up against. The one at the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, that's looking much healthier. Because um, like what we're, what we're, uh, we're opening up the the critique of the paper by Dietz, and like, I'll show it on screen as well. Can you, can you, yeah. We can just give me a tick to, um, to find the actual paper. And just show how um, how ridiculous the um, the paper itself is, and say so that this is something which is you know has to be challenged. Hereabouts, okay. So I'll just bring it up here. Okay. Now I'll just hang. On, I've got to make my screen a bit make it possible to see this thing when I bring it up on screen. So, okay, that'll do. So let's go do and do a presentation. Okay, now here's, if you can see this particular paper, uh, the text I want to focus on is the two parts I've got in yellow here. Uh, using a second order polynomial to fit the data. This is the thing on tipping points, by the way. So they're using a, quite, they're using a parabola, two degrees of warming in the absence of tipping points corresponds to 2.3 degrees in the presence of tipping points. So what they're saying is that losing the Antarctic, Antarctic summer sea ice, Greenland ice sheet, the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet, the Amazon rainforest, uh, the um, uh, permafrost, uh, Asian methane hydrates and the Indian Ocean, Indian uh, monsoon, that will just <laughs> increase the damages by 15%. Over, over the damages caused by temperature rise alone. And then tipping points reduce global consumption by 1% with three degrees warming and 1.4% with six degrees warming. That is crazy. Uh, that is the point we made about it. That there's, if that's what you've concluded with your research, your research is crap. Well, and so the, the, the referees basically had to concede it. Yeah, that's to say that those incredible changes to the climate will cause such a trivial change to the economy shows there's got to be something wrong with their reasoning. And the Everest have conceded that at PNAS. Yeah, okay. So do they acronym, say, does the paper say anything or describe the tipping points and the economic, like give specific examples of what would happen? Like well, is there any they, they, rationale they, in that paper? No, well, the rationale is we're, ta we're taking a look at what economists have said about tipping points and here's our – non-biased collation of their views and adding it together all the different studies. They, they actually had 21 papers. This is giving you an idea of what's going on here. In the economic literature, they found 21 papers discussing tipping points. So what they and then and there were the eight tipping points they looked at. And so that was this is the result of collating all of those and saying if you add them all up, what are the say is the damage to GDP? The answer is 1.4 percent at six degrees temperature increase. Um, so you've got to look at the actual papers themselves to see What's the logic? And the logic pretty much is to say, well, we don't understand most of climate change, so we're going to reduce it all to temperature change. And then we're going to regionalise the temperature change and believe that only places exposed to the weather are going to be affected by climate change. So if you have, uh, my favourite example is one by Richard Toll, of course, um, uh, using his, I think it's called, he calls, he calls his MAPA fund, um, he said that losing the AMOX, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, uh, which would, to give you an idea of the scale of change, would drop the temperature in Germany by between 3 and 10 degrees Celsius during winter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Losing that will increase GDP. 
because it will correct a bit of the change in temperature caused by global warming. And, and therefore, losing AMOC is a good thing. And Tol actually says that. Be good to lose the AMOC. That is a bunch of economists thinking they can redesign the planet and make it work better. You know? oh, is- so it's, it's insanely stupid. And you, what we've said is this paper should have, if it got the conclusion that that's what the economic papers say will be the effect of losing these tipping points in the climate, then there's something wrong with the studies. It's not, the same, it's not saying our conclusion is that losing these eight elements of the climate will reduce GDP by 1.4%. That shouldn't be the conclusion. The conclusion should be if that's what these studies say, then there's got to be something wrong with these studies. Yeah, yeah. I have a question about inflation as it relates to GDP. Mm. Okay, so the, the GDP is, 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 you know, pretty much the, the economic manifestation of God, pretty much. Like, it's, it's like the single it's, force. It's God, it. yeah, yeah. So if, if production went down, but inflation went up, um, could we not see the, 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 the gross domestic product actually, um, because of a price rise of existing products inside the economy, and the turnover, I, I don't know. That's what I'm, the, I'm, I'm curious about the, the interaction between inflation and GDP. If you okay. can have well, the, the actual production. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, 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 when you, the crazy thing in economics is that what is real is nominal and what is, what is real is fake and what is, what is nominal is real. Uh, because when you talk about GDP, it's first of all measured by adding up all the dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay. So your, your great measure for nominal GDP is actually recording actual dollar transactions and saying what the sum of those dollar transactions are. Now, to create what economists call real GDP, you have to deflate all those uh, numbers by a price index. And there's two types of price indices, the Laplace, and I've forgotten the name of the other, Laplace and another one. But what they do is they divide this year's output by last, they divide this year's output into price times quantity for every good, so this year's price times this year's quantity, and they then divide it by last year's quantity times this year's price, or vice versa, to try to work out how much of the changes have reflected change in the quantity components of GDP versus change in the price components of GDP. And then to do that, they have to say, well, what is a current consumption bundle? Because it doesn't matter, for example, if the price of platinum cubes quadruples because almost nobody buys platinum cubes. So you've got to say, what is the consumption distribution as well? And that um, that itself reflects the income distribution because if you have a very fair distribution of income, then almost nobody can avoid, afford to buy quant- uh, platinum cubes. But if you have a highly skewed distribution, then a substantial subset of the population can buy quantum cube, uh, platinum cubes, but they won't turn up in this consumer price index because there's such a small part of the population that can actually do that. So all this stuff makes it extremely hard to, to divulge out of changes in the monetary value of GDP what changes in real out, physical output are. And uh, one of the things that I think is happening with this current inflationary surge is that it's driven by breakdown in the supply chains so it's harder to physically supply the goods. Less of them are turning up, and the price is being increased both because it costs more to bring the stuff into the market, and people are competing for the numbers. That, for example, my my uh, son-in-law put sorry put together my new computer. My this desktop I had about the last year now. He tells me that I could take the uh, video card out of this machine and sell it secondhand for more than the new cost cost of the computer. The reason being that because of the chip shortages that have occurred, less GPUs have been manufactured. The chip shortages themselves reflect both COVID and a um, a drought in Taiwan Hmm. that affected the availability of water, which is part of the manufacturing process of making uh, GPUs. Um, So that price has gone through the roof. now, the, what what this means is, and this is because of all the, the chips being used for GPUs are being used for um, Bitcoin mining. So that's also the demand side of things. So there's a huge melange of, of factors in there. Now, does this mean that the you know doubling of
be poorer. No, what it might make mean is workers can no longer afford to buy decent computers. So We're going to say that one again because somehow it just uh, the the GDB God uh, censored us, and somehow you got bleeped out. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I'll try that again. Well, what you, 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 so the, the whole thing starts with actual recorded dollar sales. So it's easy to add up the number, the monetary value of GDP. What's hard to tell is how much is the change in GDP from one year to the next. If you get a changes in the prices of individual components of GDP or to the quantity being produced of different goods. So you then have indices where you, you, you've, 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 your top number in the index is today's prices times today's quantities. The, denu- the de- denominator, and, the diverse, and that, from that you subtract last year's prices and last year's quantities. And then your divisor is last year's quantities times this year's prices. The, it's quite a complicated statistical process to do it. And then you have to have a bundle, a consumer price index bundle, that says what average people spend their money on. So that also reflects the distribution of income. So all this stuff makes working out what inflation actually is incredibly complicated. And what people are worried about is sustained inflation. Well, yeah. sustained inflation then gets involved in how much of the price increase uh, ends up in people demanding a wage rise to compensate for the price increase. And that reflects the bargaining power of workers. Now, the bargaining power of workers now is nothing compared to what it was back in the 1970s. So I don't expect that flow-through stage to happen. What I do expect that if some goods become, uh, you know, the price increase is sustained for some commodities, then those commodities will drop out of the consumption bundle of workers. Mm. And then you'll find you'll get a high level of inflation recorded now, but when the consumption bundle is revised in one or two years' time or five years' time, you'll find those goods are no longer part of the workers' consumption bundle. So they'll drop out of the bundle that's used to calculate CPI. Right. So it's just like a um, uh, variable that can be updated and changed. So in yeah. principle, yeah. you're okay with the baseline pretty much because there's no other – That's a, it's an agreed-upon baseline which you can't seem to um, – yeah, it's it's always going to be it's it's never going to be ideal. I won't say imperfect. I hate the word imperfect. Mm. It implies perfection exists, um, but it's always going to be compromised as a as a calculation standard. And um, and and the people's theories about what causes inflation as well are the yet even more complex messes. You know, uh, the arguments that um, Friedman made to argue it's all because of the amount of money created by the government. No, it's not. Um, so it. My feeling is the inflation we're seeing won't last because it's mainly showing a, a breakdown process, mm-hmm. not that it's something which is, um, as it was back in the 70s, um, OPEC, uh, the you know, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, being mainly Arab Muslim, um, causing a blockade of America uh, after the Yom Kippur War, saying we're not going to sell any oil to you, uh, causing a quadrupling. That was the bargaining power of the OPEC group. Now, the bar- that bargaining power has not quite been eliminated, but it's been removed. The bargaining power of workers isn't there anymore either. The unions have been destroyed in the meantime. So the- this price spike we're seeing now can't lead to the sort of distribution of income battles we saw back in the 70s that gave us stagflation. What they're more likely to see is prices will go up, workers can't afford this stuff anymore, and it drops out of the CPI. Yeah, and I think that that's a timely wrap up to uh, the episode, uh, primarily because it, it made me think about Jurgen Randers, and he's going to be with us, yeah. um, you know, next week for our Good. next week's recording. Recording. Yeah. Um, I think I I, I seem to um, you know follow that similar type of trajectory, and that's in his book 2052. He talks about that mm-hmm. uh, about the trajectory of. Um, expense and you know the 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 breakdown of society so it, it's it's quite an it's quite an interesting book i'd i'd um kind of sped read it at one point but then going yeah. back to it i'm spending a little bit more time on it I'm, and I'm, 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 i might reread the limits to growth because i have the there's a pdf of that on the web which is freely available uh because my copy the like i bought the limits to growth in 1972 or 73 uh, as soon as it was available in australia i bought it and read it 
And my book is complete. Have you, what, have you got a, the, the paperback of Limits to Growth? Uh, not a paperback, but I read everything digitally anyways. Okay, yeah. So I, I have the original paperback and mm -hmm. it's it's fallen apart. And, <laughs> and like there was, they had an insert in the middle, which was um, like, you know, green computer paper to show you the entire model. I think I've still got that, but it's back oh, in really? Amsterdam. Yeah, it's back in Amsterdam, so I can't consult it before Radisson. But I'll definitely re-read re The Limits to Growth and I compare it to what Nordhaus ridiculed it as. And what I might also do and make this, this might be a benefit to Randers, I'll put the population component of Limits to Growth into Minsky. Because, oh, wow, because that's exciting. Part of um, part of what um, Nordhaus used to crit criticise limits to growth was arguing that the equations gave you an increase in population when you had an increase in wealth. Now, what he did was typical neoclassical ceteris paribus. He held a lot of things constant. And the re rejoinder from Forrester, which is published in another journal, of course, not an economics journal, can't have criticism of economics and economics journals, uh, he showed that when you had the, the full dynamics of the limits growth model, increasing income and falling population growth, which is what we see in the real world. So I'll see if I can complete that component in Minsky by the time we meet with Randers next week. That's an early Christmas present for him. <laughs> I'll give it a try. <laughs> that would be great. How did yeah. the, oh, and one final thing, how did the Uganda event go? Oh, that it was, was good. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's like when I first got contacted by them, a woman called uh, Kiko Mary, I can't think of her last name, but Kiko, wrote to me and I thought, this just sounds like a Nigerian scan letter. And then the final line, she wrote, we have watched your appearances on CGTN. Oh, oh shit, this is real. Okay. So it's a the real person, real contact. And she, and I said, I, I wrote a little piece about her group and she was incredibly persistent. Every day I'd get a comment on WhatsApp, how are you, Dr. Steve, have you done this yet? And I'm forever getting, so I said, look, I'll, I'll do what I promise, but it took me a while to get there. Well, the beauty of uh, doing the seminar last week was, uh, the, the, you know, the internet connection was lousy, you drop that all the time and so on. But they took me for sort of a, a camera-guided tour of their little institution. It's real. They showed me, the, I, I gave them a $100 donation. They showed me the sewing machine they bought with that $100. Oh, they great. Had, they had three, <laughs> they've now got four. Um so it was, it was, it, and you could see all the, the people, you know, training groups and stuff like that, teachers. Um, so it made it a very real and very personal thing for me, and I was delighted by it. I haven't put it up on Patreon yet. I'll have to do that. And Dan, we got to talk. I mean, I'm very happy to have you getting involved in redesigning my Patreon site as well. Uh, but I, I've got to pay for a higher level of Patreon support to get that, to have more than one person there. So I'll check up and see what that is, what's involved in that. Right when on. you put that sewing machine video up, you can splice it with the scene when uh, Mottel finally gets the sewing machine in uh, the Fiddler on the Roof and the yeah. rabbi and his friends come around and they all stare and they say, oh, and, and the camera's looking up oh, so yeah. you think it's a baby and then you realize it's a sewing machine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to ask this, this one question. Who today is making these massive synoptic models like um, the limits to growth where you have resources and food and population there. So all you have all, I mean, it seems like it'd be so much fun just to experiment with it. We have all the simulation powers today. So who's the there person is, putting in all these variables and coming up with a gigantic comprehensive model like that? There is Kerry King in Austin, Texas, I think. Kerry King, good friend of mine. Um, there is Jorgen Randers working with a laptop and one research assistant part-time in, I think that's who you think is in Norway. Um, um, myself, as much as time I get using my Minsky software to do it, um, two researchers or ex-colleagues of mine at Kingston now working for the French Development Agency. Um, um, Irene Monsantarello, who's now a professor, I think, in Austria. Uh, I'm actually Italy. She's moved to Italy. Um, I literally know everybody who's doing it. There's about six to eight people with a trivial, uh, no, no funding worth speaking of and doing it in their spare time. Wow. Well, this would be the time to do it because, look, Google provides all this stuff for free. There's so much big data out there ready to go. All big data, to but it, it right takes time. time to design a flow chart, and that's the problem. Uh, you know, putting one of these models together is an intricate process of assembling different elements of a, of a complex system and then getting to interact with each other and getting sort of semi-realistic runs out of it. So it's hard work. We don't have the time. We don't have the people. On the other hand, the neoclassicals have hundreds, if not thousands of people now involved in their fictional pursuits. I have some ideas on that, but guys, it is now two minutes after nine o'clock. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, Steve, thanks for, for another episode. Scott, thank you for joining yeah. us. And until next week, again, Jurgen Randers will be joining us. We're out of here. Thanks again. There you go. Bye. Bye.